Thanks for joining us for the Esri AEC community call. We've got a very full session today. Thanks for taking time this morning, this afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are and perhaps when you're watching. I'm Mark Goldman. I'm the director of AEC Industry Solutions. I work to define and execute on the strategy to deliver solutions to the AEC industry at Esri. Hello, I'm Laurence Litrico. I'm leading marketing programs for AEC, and I work closely with the sales and professional services teams to promote awareness of Esri solutions and grow the AEC community. We're going to take a couple of minutes on some AEC community topic, then we're going to jump into the main topic, which is about the user conference. We're really going to cover quite a bit today. The bunch of sessions from UC, they're available until the end of the month. All of our users get free registration. So if you haven't registered, you still can actually and get access to all this content. We're going to um, actually be joined by some Esri staff, product management, sales engineers, and also some of our users are going to present some of the content that they either presented at UC or that they submitted as part of the map gallery. And we're gonna tell you at the very end, some remind you about some ways to connect with us. So firstly, if you have not yet filled in our community survey form, please do so. Uh, the idea of this is to collect information from you, our community members, and then deliver that information back to the community so you all can interact with each other, find like-minded professionals who may have an expertise that you need to utilize. So you can either snap a picture of that QR code to fill in the survey or go to that URL. There's a couple of demographics questions and then two questions to gauge your area of expertise and your areas of interest. And then that brings it to a map. So here the uh, AEC community members uh, map is displayed just for the US where you can see check boxes to filter down product experience to find people, like I said, that might have an expertise that you need. And it has all the capabilities you'd expect of a Esri map. And then click on any of the little push pins, find out that individual's information, contact them directly via email, the main topic of the day, UC 2020, it was, you know, unlike any other, it was as great as, as the, in many ways. It was, you know, I think in some places we learned a lot there as we, you know, continue to do events and probably move more towards virtual and live events, a hybrid over the, the coming months. Tons and tons of content is still available for you to access. So like I said, our, our users get free access to the whole UC. If you have not yet registered, you still can gain access to all this content. And if you're registered and caught bits and pieces, we're gonna go through some content here to remind you how to find what you might've missed. First, there was the plenary, which was presented over three days. You can access all the great insights from, from Jack and others. I was really, impressed with the plenary. You know, it was great to be able to watch the recordings now of three really thought-provoking days, some really powerful stories about how GIS is making a difference in the world, in AEC, in industries that, you know, maybe you, you don't think about all the time, but it's amazing what we're doing around the globe. Day one with Jack's storytelling really left me inspired. Some amazing videos telling, you know, Esri's story and Jack does an amazing job himself. You know, we're doing amazing things. I encourage you to watch all of Jack's day one plenary if you get a chance. My favorite part of the three sessions were actually able to see demonstrations of the latest technology and capabilities of ArcGIS. I'm in marketing and strategy now, but my roots go back to being a hands-on user. I'm a tinkerer of software, so I love a good demo and day two was just full of them. I've actually gone back a number of times now to the day two recording to see a couple of demos. One that stands out, uh, Michelle's demo of the interaction of ArcGIS and BIM 360 at the documents level and models being displayed, bringing BIM and GIS data together. It's here. It's really for all to use. Updates from each system being reflected in the other. You know, it's what a lot of people have been wishing for. And we've got a lot of room to grow in that integration, but it was great to see that on the, I think essentially the main stage. I love seeing Jeremiah discuss and demonstrate site scan personally getting into reality capture and drones, and I know I'm going to be using SiteScan for planning, processing, and visualizing reality capture workflows just to my own, I want to say professional, but uh, sort of amateur playing around with, with, with drones and such. Uh, day three, it was a great surprise, a nice gift with 
which Jack and National Geographic gave all of us a special offer, three months free access for Esri users to nationalgeographic.com, which includes a lot. And it was really just a small token as part of a much larger partnership between Esri and National Geographic. And that was just truly inspiring, you know, just tingles, you know, watching the videos that were produced telling the stories there. And what I found to be really great is the ability to pause, rewind, and replay parts, which I missed the first go around. So I really encourage you to go to the plenary. The way in order to do that is once you go to the UC, there's the panel of dashboards or of uh, billboards, if you will, across the main page. Plenary is one of them. Watch Now takes you to the screen that I just had on here for a minute or so. And then here you can choose day one, two, or three. I think there were over 125 technical workshops. Um, these are just a few which I found interesting. I knew I wanted to watch them beforehand and I, in fact, did not get a chance to. So I since have actually had a chance to watch. They apply to AEC and GIS in general. Uh, the last topic on BIM and GIS will actually go into more detail in a minute with the presenter of that session. And that was a very popular one. To search for technical workshops, you want to click on the sessions menu bar at the very top view all workshops at the bottom, and then type in a keyword. Um, so in this case, we typed in asset and it brought up a list of presentations integrating BIM and GIS for AEC and asset owners. Then you'll click through where you can watch the recording and it either pops up within the player itself or you can actually do a, a window in window and have it uh, view on your screen to a higher resolution, higher, higher visibility than just within that little panel there. So with that, Laurence, do you wanna introduce Anthony? Yes. Anthony Renteria, who's the product manager in charge of AEC workflow integration, Hi there. is today to introduce the presentation he recorded. Anthony, take it away. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. So just to give a quick overview of what um, we presented during the session. So over the last several years right, at UC, we've actually had this like BIM and GIS integration session. And it, most of the time, it's been over more of a focus on like how do you use BIM as a GIS user, right? Or what is BIM, right? Because for a while we've been really communicating like why is BIM important to the GIS persona specifically? But over the course of the, that time period, obviously we've shared a lot of information about that and it's kind of grown within our community. And so what we wanted to do this time around was more focus on the updates that we've achieved with BIM and GIS, but also recognize that there's still more to go, right? And, and what you want to do within your workflows. So when we're focusing on this, it's, it's a three-parter basically within the hour session. Um, I presented with Don Keeney and David Alvarez who are within the product management and uh, development um, teams here at Esri. And we basically split this up into three. So the first section being more of a focus on influencing the BIM and integration story, right? Our users really have told us what they want out of it, right? Because part of this is we wanna make sure we're, we're making changes and updates to your workflows that actually enhance the way you communicate your work, but then also share it with users as well. And so what we were really focusing on is how do you interact with your data and really enable that process moving forward. And so then it goes into a quick overview of all the different um, types of integrations that we've been focusing on over the last year or so. Um, Don focuses on first the idea of bringing GIS data into design applications. So with ArcGIS for AutoCAD or some of our partner um, integrations like Autodesk Connectors within Civil 3D or InfraWorks, uh, but then even another partner like uh, Vectorworks who has built their own integration that helps bring GIS data into their BIM platform. And so after going through that aspect of it, it's more of this communication of how do you bring your BIM content directly into ArcGIS Pro so you can actually visualize it and then build out more engagement um, opportunities within web services, right? So focusing on new capabilities that we've just released with making your connection as a GIS user working in ArcGIS Pro to Autodesk BIM 360 repository. So being able to pull data directly from BIM 360, whether that's Revit, uh, DWG files, or even DGN actually, if, if they have the word fi world files associated in that repository and you bring that into your ArcGIS Pro desktop, you'll be able to actually georeference your file directly at, once you bring it in at that point. And so really we talked about the other uh, capabilities we've added. So some of the more direct read capabilities with Civil 3D. So bringing in parcels, pipe networks, and other things from Civil 3D and having a direct read um, experience within ArcGIS Pro. 
but then also talking about some of the new things that are coming down the line. So what are we doing next, right? And we know a big part of that is IFC. So uh, there is a quick little introduction on what we're planning for IFC, but that's still something that's in the works and will be coming down into the future. And then finally, the last part of the section was more focused on a demo, basically, of the data that you're interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis. And David basically goes through and showcases um, a specific case where we've seen this a lot within the AC space, but also operations, where as a user working with an ArcGIS Pro, you want to share your data with different types of communities, right? But being able to uh, publish data and have it like both populate and update within both of those same scenes. So something you might have a, a web view or web service view of maybe a construction, live progress updating type of situation, right? Where you have a feature uh, service that you want actually to populate there, but then you also have another view where it might be more of an owner centric view of the data. Being able to make updates within these new workflows are just released this year. Um, so that you can make an update and have it actually populate to both of those views. So that's a really quick <laughs> overview of what we talked about, right, going from the beginning to the end. But um, yeah, that, that's a great uh, little snapshot. Thank you, Anthony. It was, it was a great session. It was comprehensive. It served as a primer for me in a lot of ways, but also opened my eyes to um, things that are, we're capable of now delivering in AEC around BIM and GIS. So it was a great session. I encourage everyone to to seek it out. Yeah, and, and definitely pl please provide us feedback too, right? We wanna make sure that we're building products that work for what you're working on, right? And we wanna hear from you for sure. So please let us know. Thank you. So we had 11 presentations created and recorded by our users on AEC topics specifically. These are listed here. Really great sessions on topics that were AEC centric, GIS centric, some of them a little general as well and they had introduced themselves in their sessions on our previous AEC user community webinar. So hopefully you've seen some of these. If not, you know, jot down some keywords here. And then what you can do is actually go to the UC dashboard, the main page, sessions at the top, scroll down to the very bottom, and you'll see view user presentations. And from there you can um, keywords to find them. The expo is still open. This is a great source for company and product information from our sponsors and exhibitors. It's consistently organized, it's concise, five to 10 links per page, videos, some immersive booths as well, which were really um, great to engage with and find information in an immersive manner. You've got really everything you need to know about a partner in the Esri ecosystem. So I really encourage you to go to the expo as well as the Esri showcases. Those are open too as well. So those will remain open until the end of the month, though it's a great way just to click through to the different industry sectors and product team pages, find great resources from you know, basic intros on products that you might be interested to really in-depth resources as well, connecting you to you know, bits of info that you just probably weren't aware of. And in many cases, a lot of great content boiled up to the surface through the organization of our virtual UC this year. And then our team of product experts and sales engineers, they did a great job with their sessions. Those are available on demand and worth carving up some time to watch. We've actually got the presenters of those sessions here to talk about them in just a second. First, just to let you know, so to access the showcases, Expo at the top of the menu, and then the showcase, which is the Esri sessions in this case, scroll down to the bottom, find AEC, and here you can find the two presentations which our peers and colleagues are going to talk about, the BIM and GIS innovations in engineering and delivery and AEC project delivery subscription. Daniel Chantlow's solution engineer for AEC is joining us today to introduce the presentation he recorded with David Reeves and Mike Aikello. Daniel? Hi everyone, hope you're doing well today. A bit along the same lines as what Anthony was detailing, in his presentation, we also focus on BIM and GIS collaboration in this presentation. We discuss the common roadblocks with current digital delivery patterns for AECs. This involves a brief overview of the common patterns and roadblocks that you would historically encounter when working with many different teams and software applications during the AEC project life cycle. 
From this, we discuss how Esri's partnership with Autodesk has progressively grown to develop integrated connectors and design software that help break down these barriers between GIS, BIM, and CAD design workflows for a more optimized project lifecycle that can be maintained much more efficiently. From this, we then detail an actual greenfield project site using Esri and Autodesk applications, showing how they can be leveraged from desktop services to field ops applications to design, collect, and digitally deliver projects through AEC project delivery. Uh, this was a very quick overview, uh, so I hope you could take the time to watch our presentation and learn more about how we're really helping break down the traditional barriers between CAD, BIM, and GIS to help AECs with their full project life cycles. Thank you, Daniel. The next presenter is Brian Ferry, Solution Engineer with Esri. Brian will introduce the Project Delivery Subscription Presentation he recorded with Andy Creek. Brian? Uh, yeah, thanks, Laurence. Uh, hi, everybody. In our on-demand presentation, my colleague, Andrew Creek and I talk about Esri's AEC project delivery subscription, ArcGIS Hub, and Hub Premium. So there are a variety of challenges we in the AEC industry encounter throughout a typical project lifecycle, from managing data to collaborating and communicating both internally and with clients or stakeholders, to of course delivering content and services to our customers. We'll go a bit more in depth about these challenges and opportunities in this presentation, presenting AEC project delivery and ArcGIS Hub as solutions to these challenges. An AEC project delivery subscription is essentially a special licensing model we've created to address the needs of our AEC customers and some workflows specific to our industry. It includes two creator licenses so that both you and your client have access not only to project data, but also to web maps, web apps, mobile apps, ArcGIS online content, et cetera. A project delivery subscription then is a means to modernize and digitize your project delivery. We'll review some of the many benefits of deploying a project delivery subscription for your organization, as well as a few of the more common technical configurations you might choose to go with, which may depend on your existing GIS infrastructure. We've also got a quick demo showing you how to set up a project delivery organization in ArcGIS Online and invite new users to that organization. A project delivery subscription is a really effective system for communicating and collaborating between GIS teams, engineers, architects, and project managers. Um, but we also, of course, see the importance of communicating with non-technical staff and even the larger community or public in some cases. In order to connect with purpose with these audiences, we have ArcGIS Hub and Hub Premium. ArcGIS Hub enables you to present information to your project team, stakeholders, and to the public through modern, engaging websites. These websites are collaborative and allow you both to present and to gather data from the community. Hub Basic is included with your project delivery subscription and offers a variety of useful templates to help you get set up. Andy takes us through some of the more common use cases for our hub sites and reviews some great examples from state, local, and national government. AEC firms, and some others. Now there's of course a lot more information in our full UC presentation, so if you've got 15 minutes, please do check it out. Thank you, Brian. Every year at the user conference, hundreds of users submit their map for the map gallery. Joining us today are four users that submitted a story map for the virtual map gallery. The first presenter is Zachary Jaffe. Yeah, so Zach is the GIS coordinator at Land Tech. He started his career in Texas in water utility operations. He moved to Boston area, transitioned to GIS and surveying, and now he spends his time focusing on 3D data acquisition and GIS integration and implementation at Land Tech. He's got a really cool project here. It was a great virtual map that we were able to interact with, reached out to him, told us about the project. Take it away, Zach. Thank you, guys. I'm going to be discussing 3D GIS for vertical or indoor asset management, specifically focusing on the as the map I submitted for the Esri UC. So I'm gonna be talking about kind of how this project came to life and what this workflow looked like. So before diving too deep into it, a little bit about Land Tech Consultants. We're a civil engineering and land surveying firm based in Massachusetts with an office branch in Southern Florida. We began as a smaller firm focused on private land development, but through the years we've become early adopters of advanced technologies, including GPS, total stations, drone, LiDAR scanners, BIM, and GIS modeling. So a lot of our work entails creating existing condition surveys and documentations of water and wastewater treatment plants. The deliverables for these surveys and projects were in the form of 
point clouds in FIM models. Our clients started coming back to us and saying, these models are great and they, you know, they serve their purpose, but how can we take it a step further and integrate these models with GIS for the purpose of asset management, as well as with the goal of making all of this data readily available for the field technicians. To walk you guys what our solution to these two problems was, we began with a point cloud that was, that was created via a LiDAR survey. We then took that point cloud and modeled it in Revit, but this does work with a variety of different softwares. Using ArcGIS Pro's tools, we brought that Revit model into ArcGIS where we geo-referenced it, as well as we're able to add and edit the attributes. And of course, you're, you're really geo-referencing it. That's you know, a pretty big benefit of bringing these Revit models into the GIS environment. We then, working with VGIS, another ESRI partner, were able to publish this model into the virtual reality or augmented reality world. So this is what it would look like through a hollow lens or an iPad that a field technician might have. So I'm gonna play two videos showing you what this workflow looks like live. So this first one was for Miami-Dade Water and Sewer. Um, and it was pretty cool because we did use a variety of different data acquisition techniques including a LiDAR survey, a drone flight, as well as conventional surveying. So as you can see, as we go inside the treatment plant, you'll notice the extremely high level detail of the point cloud, where you can see the bolts and nuts of the features. And here I transitioned right into the ArcGIS Pro environment, where it's that same model to scale, that millimeter point cloud accuracy, as well as that extremely high level of detail where you can see the bolts, the nuts, and the screws of these features. And because these are GIS features, I just kind of walk through how you can interact with them like any other GIS feature, showing hyperlinks to a work board you might have associated with it. As well as a website catalog pictures, just kind of showing how it really is just like a 2D feature you might be used to. And I just kind of zoom out to the overall scene that I created. So that was the solution to our first step of integrating the VIM models with GIS. So this is a video of the second step of deploying these models for the field techs to use in the field. So here I show what it looks like on the back end. I'm just showing again some basic GIS functionality where the GIS tech might be you know, searching for all valves that need to be replaced inside the treatment plant. Again, it's pretty high, high level of detail model. I symbolize the valves um, by that attribute needs to be replaced, they're viewed in red. Again, showing hyperlinks to outside sources, for example, um, an asset management software where you can view the associated attributes as well as a work order, for example. A little more sophisticated than in Excel. And again, another form of documentation your field tech might want associated with that feature. I'm gonna pause it here real, real quick. So this was when our field tech actually went on site with the model using the VGIS application, where they're gonna be seeing the model in real time overlaid on what's actually there on site. We've seen the future and the future is here. Oh, the, the future is here, that's for sure. This is great, Zach. Yeah, thank you. And because all this mod, all this data is pulling from the ArcGIS database, you're going to be seeing the same attributes, same hyperlink, same connection. So when your field tech does, does get to the job that you know they can walk through the room virtually before getting there, have the model on top of the actual assets and be able to click on it to confirm, okay, this is the valve that needs to be replaced. These are the tools or pieces of equipment I'm going to need uh, to fix it and accomplish my task for the day. So that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for listening. If anyone has any questions, here's my contact information. Definitely feel free to reach out as well as I can get you a link to that online map so you can play around with it yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zach.
Our next presenter is Olivia Godfrey. Olivia is a GIS analyst for Langan Engineering in the San Francisco Bay Area. She graduated from UC Santa Barbara in 2017 with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies. She came to Langan with a background in energy resources and sustainability. For the past three years, she's been working in the AEC industry, providing GIS services on a variety of environmental, geotechnical, and site civil projects. Olivia? Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be a part of this presentation today, and I'm truly excited to talk about the exciting things we're doing with sustainability over at Langan. As Volant said, my name is Olivia Godfrey, and I am a GIS analyst at Langan Engineering, currently based out of Oakland, California. My passion for sustainability definitely comes from my time spent as an environmental studies major emphasizing in GIS. I brought my interest for sustainability to Langan when I was hired, and I was excited to hear about all the initiatives that Chris Glenn, our sustainability director, and his team were continually working on. And I knew that I wanted to get involved somehow. After attending a few presentations on ArcGIS Insights at the 2019 SV User Conference, I thought Insights might be a good tool to introduce to our sustainability team. A little about Langan. We are a full service site development design firm with over 1,200 employees in 33 different offices around the globe. It has always been Langan's mission to provide its clients with technical excellence and a pra and practical experience. But Langan also wants to show its commitment to building a sustainable future and promoting environmental stewardship. Corporate sustainability was born out of grassroots efforts by Langan employees in the early 2000s who wanted our offices to be more sustainably conscious with our internal operations. Over time, those efforts paid off and sustainability became a formal corporate initiative in 2012. Since then, Langan has grown active green teams in 100% of our U.S. offices, published its very own corporate sustainability plan, and even established a firm-wide award that recognizes Langan projects that go above and beyond our commitment to sustainability. Some fun facts about our progress so far. We have reduced electricity usage company-wide about 16% below U.S. average through green office operation and remodel. Before working from home kicked in, about 54% of our U.S.-based employees worked in LEED certified buildings. And in 2018 and 2019, we achieved a zero net carbon footprint, making us a carbon neutral firm. But Langan's sustainability team doesn't want to stop there. To support Langan's corporate sustainability vision, the team set measurable goals and uh, that correspond to the company's core values and triple bottom line, financial, environmental, and social. And this is where we wanted to capitalize on ArcGIS Insights as an analytics workbench to help measure past, present, and future sustainability metrics in one single location. What's important to us about this tool is that it makes information accessible to the employees of our company to equip them with the knowledge and provide opportunities to get them more involved as environmental stewards themselves. Our ArcGIS Insights platform is currently a tool that allows our employees to interact with sustainability data through bar charts, line graphs, and tables. We've also been able to utilize the mapping aspect of Insights to show more spatial components of sustainability, such as where all of our LEED certified offices are located. What Insights has been great for is also being able to create pages dedicated solely to housing resources and links for employees to do their own sustainability research. For example, we've created a page for helping employees choose what sustainability credentials work for them so that they can earn credentials from organizations such as LEED and Envision. Overall, we have been able to find ways to bring together scattered parts of our sustainability program into one site that is both user-friendly and also fun to explore. But let me go back to the data and the metrics. Langan sustainability metrics have been compiled over the years and are currently being managed by our corporate sustainability program staff. Her name's Nicole McCallum. Nicole and I have collaborated to transform boring Excel documents about carbon emissions, electricity usage, and such into interactive charts and colorful graphics using the tools and capabilities of Insights. To the average employee, numbers on a page don't really mean a lot. But if they can see how their metrics compare to other Langan offices, maybe, they might try to pay a little bit more attention. Paper usage is a metric that the sustainability team paid more attention to in 2017 when they hosted the first firm-wide paper reduction challenge. By the end of the challenge, the team was able to spread more awareness and encourage more paperless practices 
an inner office competition that was held over a six month period of time. Our Miami, Florida office ended up winning by reducing their paper usage by an average of 10%. Across the board, between 2013 and 2018, Langen reduced annual paper usage by 50%. To put that into perspective, that's about 36 tons of paper saved. Or, if you want to put it into number of trees, that's about 400 trees. And to put it into financial perspective, that's about $300,000 savings per year in printing costs. Through Insights, an employee can now see these numbers for themselves too. For paper usage, we've set up a page with maps, line graphs, and tables that allow you to explore paper usage in individual office locations where we have been able to gather data. So if an employee from our San Francisco office wants to know how much paper their office is using, they can look to the line graphs that display monthly paper usage for a given year. The three charts you see represent data from 2013, 2016, and 2019. The upper image shows all the offices together, while the lower image shows just the San Francisco office data that is isolated when you click on the office location in the map or in the legend. This data that would otherwise be confined to an Excel is now accessible to a variety of individuals and teams who might look at these numbers. And they can ask, okay, what can we do as next steps to continually improve our level of sustainability? In this case, someone from our San Francisco green team can observe that paper usage was declining at the end of 2019, and they can ask, okay, so how can we keep that up? And they can also ask and see, what have we done so far to help those numbers decline? In short, our ArcGIS Insights page will always be a work in progress as we continue to gather more data about our internal operations, but it's the goal of ours to maintain this page as a central hub for tracking and visualizing this data for all Langan employees to see for themselves. These are our main goals for right now. First, expanding the use and continue exploring all the tools that ArcGIS Insights has to offer. The second, continue providing our employees with reliable information and educational resources to inspire and incentivize their sustainable actions. And lastly, we want to expand our sustainability services to our clients utilizing GIS solutions to help manage and visualize their own sustainability data. If you have any questions about sustainability at Langen, I've listed my contact information, as well as emails for Nicole McCallum and Chris Glenn, who are the primary contacts for our corporate sustainability program. And if you would like to check out the original story map, feel free to scan the QR code that you see here. Thank you very much. Olivia, thank you. That was really great. One of the things we often talk about is using GIS to do work, using GIS to win work, or using GIS to run the business. And that was a really great example of using GIS to run the business as it pertains to sustainability, which is you know, a super important topic. Great project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also from Langan Engineering. His name is Michael Georgialis. He's a senior GIS analyst in Manhattan. He started in a local government planning department working on land conservation and wastewater management projects transitions to engineering consulting, and has been working in the industry for the past four years. He applies GIS on a variety of environmental, geotechnical, site civil, and urban planning projects. Michael? Thanks for inviting me to speak. Like Olivia, I'm also from Langen. And I'm going to talk about a project where we used the viewshed analysis tools in ArcGIS Pro to determine the overall visibility of a new construction project. Well, Langen was hired to conduct uh, an environmental assessment on a very large five-story warehouse and distribution center in upstate New York. Now, as part of this assessment, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation required the evaluation of aesthetic impacts. And, and by that, I mean uh, they were interested in seeing the, the visual impacts that this project may have on uh, the public's enjoyment of a resource like a park. So the project manager approached our GIS team and asked if we could help determine the overall visibility of this uh, new project within a five mile radius. So the, the project team, they were looking for something accurate, but also a quick uh, turnaround. Really, they needed something that was gonna give them just a picture of the overall visibility of this project. So that it'll help them determine whether or not they need to uh, investigate further. 
So now, as I said, we did a five mile radius and within that five miles, um, we had uh, multiple parks and public spaces that we had to look at. But on the screen now, I'm showing two resources that were of particular importance. So you can see the project building footprint there in orange. And then in green, that was a state park that's also a tourist destination. So it's very highly visited all year round. And there's also a, a scenic highway that runs along the water there that's also um, utilized uh, very highly by tourists. So these areas were of particular importance. So now the first um, step that we had to take was to figure, we had to figure out what kind of data are we going to need and what's readily available. So now this site, uh, when, you're, when you're running a, a viewshed analysis, you need some sort of elevation data. Now this site is uh, surrounded by some development, but actually quite a bit of forested area. So we needed some sort of elevation data that was going to take into account the tree canopies surrounding the, the project site. So now luckily we were able to find um, LIDAR data for most of the project study area. And we were gonna use that point cloud data to help determine the tree canopy, which would play a role in the visibility of this building. Now, unfortunately, there were some areas that were missing. And if you look at the map in the upper left there, you can see uh, one area of missing data. So this was a small island to the northwest of the project site. So the project site is there in, uh, in orange. And then you can see this small island that was, it's a completely forested island. And you can see it's right in the middle uh, of, of the sight line between the building and that state park and the scenic highway. So we needed to capture this, this area in our view shed. So now luckily there was some LIDAR data on that island and you can see a little sliver there to the, uh, the east side of that island. That green is actually point cloud data um, from the LIDAR and we were, we were able to use that data to estimate the average tree canopy height on the island. So it was about, uh, the trees were about 60 feet tall. So then what we did was we created a polygon. So you, you can see in the lower right there, a 3D polygon. We created a polygon for the missing area. And we, uh, in the attributes, we uh, set the height to 60 feet. And we just created that 3D polygon just uh, for visual purposes to see how it lined up with the, the rest of the point cloud data on, the, uh, on that little island. So now we had this. Uh, what we wanted to do then was convert this polygon into a raster because what we need to do is uh, create a digital surface model for our elevation data, which was gonna capture any type of structures or more importantly, tree canopy uh, in the surrounding study area. So on this map here, if you look to the, the right side of the map, you can see the digital surface model that we created uh, from the LIDAR point cloud data. And then if you look at the island there, you can see that raster that we created that, was, uh, that we set to 60 feet. Now we also use the plus tool. Uh, the plus tool in, um, in the ArcGIS uh, project suite uh, allows you to add the values of multiple rasters together. So we had a digital elevation model for the entire area and that gave us the ground elevation. So we used that ground elevation that we had for that island and we used the plus tool to add our 60 foot canopy to it to get a more accurate picture of the tree canopy height on that island. So we had our digital surface model uh, in the, you could see the, in orange there, we had a little, the building footprint we just built, uh, we extruded a, um, a 3D building from that and we plugged it into our view shed. Now the great thing about the view shed analysis tool and many of the tools uh, in the um, Esri suite is that once you have your data in place, uh, you could run multiple scenarios. And that's exactly what we did. So we ran a scenario with, with the building at 100 feet, uh, 115 feet tall, and also uh, finally 130 feet tall. And we looked at, uh, we compared the visibility of, of each of those buildings. Now, if you've used the ViewShed analysis tool, you'll know that the, uh, the output is a, a large raster that shows all the areas that are visible and not visible, or all the, uh, all the areas where your project or structure is gonna be visible and not visible. So we had this for the entire uh, five mile radius. Um, but what I'm showing you on the screen here in yellow is uh, just a cleaned up version for display purposes. So this is showing all the visible areas on those two resources um, 
when we had the building set at 130 feet. So you can see that there were quite a few areas where this building is uh, could potentially be viewed. So we, pro we provided this uh, data to the project team for the five mile radius. We gave them an overall picture of what uh, the potential visibility of this project could be. And the entire process from gathering the data to running the multiple scenarios to finally um, producing a, a map for the report took about four to five hours. And it was completely done you know, in the office, right on the desktop. I included on here the uh, QR code if you're interested and you wanna see the story map that we created about this for, um, for UC. But in conclusion, uh, the ViewShed analysis tool proved to be a uh, quick, cost efficient, an accurate way to determine the overall visibility of this new construction project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Our next presenter is Devin Levine. Devin is a nationally recognized innovative leader in the field of urban planning with special expertise in urban design, physical planning, graphic communication, development visualization, and GIS. Co-founder of Housing Levine Associates, a National Planning Excellence Award recipient. Devin has directed more than 150 plans using groundbreaking techniques and approaches. Devin, take it away. Great, thank you. So I wanna highlight a couple of story maps that we have featured in this year's map gallery. I think both are, I think, real exciting. One is an actual client deliverable. We delivered uh, an entire plan for this, this project right here on my screen, Jefferson Chalmers, a Detroit neighborhood. Our deliverable was this story map. And then I'll um, speak to another one, which I think is uh, really tells a story about how we use the suite of tools to, uh, to help the city out. So this story map is actually a series of uh, five different story maps sort of all wrapped in one. And so in, typically in planning, we would deliver a PDF or some type of policy guide to a community and working with the Jefferson Chalmers and East Jefferson community, uh, we were able to deliver to them this story map to help them craft the vision. So the Jefferson Chalmers Main Street Master Plan looks at Jefferson Street as it leaves downtown Detroit and heads east towards Gross Point, Michigan. We worked with the, the Jefferson Chalmers uh, neighborhood to craft the long-term vision for this corridor. It's starting to see a resurgence. There's a, a lot of investment coming into the corridor. So we, we highlighted uh, the process here in this sort of first introduction where we met with the community. We ran them through, through visioning exercises, had a, a really an intense five-day charrette. Uh, off on the left here, you can see the time frame. We started August 27th last year, and by the, uh, the 30th, we're through a five-day community charrette where we work with the community to give us ideas for this area of Detroit and to find out what their, their ultimate vision was. And what we found out were they wanted to improve the retail. They had some vacant storefronts. There's a historic site here called the Vanity Ballroom, and they wanted to see it restored. There's uh, a community center, a need for community center. There's a vacant church in the corridor. So working with the residents and the community, we identified a number of different issues from bike lanes to improving pedestrian safety and mid-block crossings and uh, infrastructure and utilities, and uh, finally open space. And so all of it was sort of wrapped up in this um, this story map, we highlighted the issues. So here's where Jefferson Chalmers sits in the city of Detroit, sort of that far uh, southeast corner right before you get to Gross Point. And then um, this is the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. And what we focused in on was the Jefferson uh, Avenue corridor. Uh, so about a mile long stretch of road, uh, we did an existing land use analysis. Uh, we looked at the current zoning. And all that helped us uh, really work with the community to get an understanding of the existing additions and then craft that vision. And uh, when we work with them to create the vision for the corridor, uh, we broke the corridor down into a couple of different areas. So not treating it all like one area. So we had the West End, the historic core, the East End, the vanity, that historic ballroom right in the middle of the corridor, and then the Site 492. So uh, again, this story map is you know, fully interactive. We can 
really query anything as we we get in here and uh, to look at um, uh, what the long term vision is uh, for this for this area. And again, this story map served as the deliverable to to the city. Um, something we love about uh, using this as a tool to deliver plans. We hear constantly from our, our clients in the cities we work with, they don't want their plans to sit on a shelf. They want a, a plan that uh, is action oriented, but more importantly, something that's interactive and story maps has definitely given us the platform. And so um, looking at the redevelopment opportunities within Jefferson Chalmers along the corridor, these uh, orange areas, we just called those opportunity sites. These were areas where we thought there was a significant opportunity for them to rehab existing buildings for opportunity, uh, so adaptive reuse. And then these red areas were priority development sites where they either had to tear a building down or develop into a vacant lot. And so we looked at five sites specifically, the Vanity Rehab, uh, this 1929 Art Deco uh, ballroom. And um, so here's what it, it looks like today. Uh, and so our vision for the ballroom was a rehab, rehab the ballroom, um, and to also rehab the Schwinn bike building that was next to it. Um, so we did some some Photoshop work here. Um, there's an opportunity for an infill a little further al along the corridor where you have this historic bank building uh, and a vacant lot. And um, this was sort of the the next vision for that area. Um, the church adaptive reuse. This is this church where we, th we thought would be an opportunity for a community center, and the um, was an old schoolyard next to the uh, the church, and so we kept that as open space, um, closed the street, and then the um, other thing we did on this project I thought was interesting. We used City Engine to help us figure out what the uh, phasing would look like, and so. Uh, we did model out the whole corridor as a just a general mass, and then we built out a dashboard to let them know in phase one, which is this immediate phase, how many jobs were getting created, uh, what the square footage was in land use, how many dwelling units, and what the total development cost would be. And as they move through the different phases, um, to see that we're adding 117 dwelling units in phase two, 905 jobs. Uh, so all those metrics are assigned into the rule files we built um, we built for them. And then they're able to sort of uh, pan through it phase by phase to see how many dwelling units they're adding each phase and what the construction costs would be. And then ultimately, we delivered a 3D web scene for them where they can um, can run through it. So that was the first one. Again, it was a, a story map we submitted, but it was it was a, a deliverable. So it wasn't really trying to show off our work. It was just uh, we thought we did a great job using Esri technology as a um, as a mechanism to deliver our work product and we just uh, submitted it to the uh, map gallery uh, this next example though this is something that uh, we use story map to highlight uh, a real successful um, experience we had working with a community in north carolina so morrisville is in the uh, research triangle the raleigh durham uh, research triangle it's right next to rdu airport um, and for the last 10 years the city has really struggled with what to do with their town center. Uh, this was an area of land that they had reserved for um, dense mixed use development. And for about a decade, uh, there was just uh, almost a political uh, stagnation. Everyone was afraid to approve a development because they weren't sure it would be consistent with the long-term vision. And so they didn't want to proceed down the wrong path. And because of that, they were approving nothing. And uh, really what was at odds was, do they want density or no density, parking garages or surface parking lots? And so we got hired to develop an immersive 3D experience. Um, so we used uh, a suite of tools uh, from SketchUp, Esri City Engine, Photoshop, ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online, and, and each of them, it had its own purpose. SketchUp primarily just as a CAD tool. I mean, it was really just to help us draft in some of the, uh, the sites. We also did some props like street lights and, and things like that. We used City Engine to make sure that the uh, the development program we had come up with 
uh, with pencil out um, and then Photoshop for all of the textures, the imagery, ArcGIS Pro for a bunch of uh, visibility analysis and view shed analysis. Online, we delivered a, um, a city engine web scene for them and then Unreal gave us that, that uh, immersive development. And so first thing we do uh, with all of our studies, we conduct a, mar a market uh, study. We wanna see what is, what's realistic from a market perspective. Uh, from there, we engage the community. We find out what does the community want for these areas. Um, so workshops, um, we have these DIY workshop kits, uh, an online website. Uh, and we came up with a sketch plan for this area of uh, really just preliminarily what the land uses would look like. We brought that into City Engine. Uh, we built out the streets in City Engine. And from there, that gave us redevelopment blocks that we brought into um, SketchUp just to really uh, draft out what the development would look like. Uh, we went back and forth with our client to sort of see if they were satisfied with the the map uh, the massing um, this the feedback we got from from Brad our client there and then inside of City Engine we're able to build out these dashboards that give us real time feedback so we can see as we add uh, building heights uh, we're going from 717 thousand square feet to a million square feet. Uh, the parking needs switches from 360 spaces to 530 spaces. And so as we uh, push and pull and manipulate the buildings, we're, we're finding out what the impacts are from a square footage of building to a uh, parking needs, dwelling unit needs. And, and this was delivered to them inside of a city engine web scene where they were able to jump in and explore uh, the development. And so here's the program for their town center and um, they can go uh, search between. And so I can toggle between the different um, uh, scenarios, scenario A, scenario B. So it was, uh, we got their feedback. This was delivered to the city council about a well, three or four days before our presentation. And they were able to query a building. And if they click on any of these buildings, they're able to see what the square footage is. It's, it's City Engine puts forward all of the data that uh, is generated. So all the square footages of ground floor uses, dwelling units, parking counts. What they really wanted to see was an immersive experience. And so we, for that, we had to go into the Unreal Game Engine. And um, let's see, so this is an export of, of the whole thing. And so in Unreal, uh, much higher visual quality, we're able to uh, give them a couple of different looks. Uh, we can turn off the lights. And uh, they had us out at the town uh, council meeting to sort of run around and show the difference. I don't know if this is coming through okay. This is the export. Are you able to see the screen here, Mark? The uh... yeah, it, yeah, it gets a little blurry on some transitions, but yeah, we're we're looking at uh, at the guy in green in the middle of the street, looking down. Yeah, yeah. So he, this is really a full video game. So this is the Unreal Game Engine. It powers Fortnite. We brought our City Engine 3D model into here and gave them the ability to really run anywhere in the town center and toggle between Scenario A and scenario B. And so if they wanted to evaluate, uh, you know, is, is three stories too tall or did they want the single story building? And they had us run around the, the town center for about 30 minutes. Uh, you know, go over here, go over there. Uh, let us see what this looks like. And overwhelmingly, what everyone sort of came to the conclusion is that a, a one story development really has sort of uh, a sense of desolation. It kind of felt like everything was too open and they liked the sense of enclosure that that the multi-story buildings were um, would provide. And um, yeah, it was a overwhelming overwhelming support for to go to the higher density and um, we left the council chambers. The city planner pulled us aside and said it was the best money they had ever spent. For 10 years, they had, were sort of deadlocked on making a decision for this town center. And within 
about a two week is two weeks is what we had to pull this together. They had decided to move forward. So we're proud of the project. They won a technology award from the American Planning Association this spring and at this year's user conference it won a special achievement in GIS award. So if you want to see it, if you go to the map gallery and just type in House of Levine, we have a, a number of uh, maps on there. You can see all of these story maps that I, the two story maps I showed, as well as some other ones. And then it should also link you to our ArcGIS Online homepage, where we do provide a lot of the um, interactive content for you to play with. So that's it. Thank you so much. Devin, thank you. You know, you uh, made a comment on your first story map that you just kind of submitted the work you did. You didn't mean for it to show anything off, but when your work shows itself off, you're doing something right. And um, I really love the work that uh, that you guys are doing. Just a quick reminder, go to GeoNet, the AEC space on GeoNet. This is, there'll be a recording of this presentation. If you'd like to share any of this with colleagues or take a look at any of these presentations again, which were just inspiring. I've used that word a few times today. Go to GeoNet. We also keep communication out to LinkedIn, a closed group only. So uh, we encourage you to find the Esri AEC user group on LinkedIn and also follow us on Twitter. Follow us, retweet us, we'll retweet you. Just you know, create this sense of community. You also will start seeing our newsletter coming out again. Next quarterly should be coming out in about a month. So keep your eyes open for that. If you have not received it, please go to this link to sign up. So thanks for your time. We look forward to talking to you again soon.